The book of Ephesians. So let's open up there. And we'll get right to it. <coughs> Immediately. We have many wondrous things to behold in God's Word. Wondrous things out of His law. Okay, the book of Ephesians. So the way we're going to do this is we'll talk about some introductory information and then we'll go to the content. So pretty much just kind of a two-part thing. What is the introductory information? And then we'll talk about the content of the book. And this is going to be based on kind of our theme. We're going to go off of the theme there. All right, so we're going to be in the introductory information first. And here we'll talk about, well, we'll talk about introductory things. So let me start with the theme. Okay, uh, for what you know about Ephesus or Ephesians and what you've heard taught or preached before, what have you heard, if at all, and now if you don't remember, that's fine, if you're not heard, what is the theme for Ephesians? Uh, unity of the church. Unity of the church, yeah, basically that's it. Uh, we're going to take the theme, the Church of the Living God. That's going to be our theme. So it's very much church-related. And for that reason, we're our, discussing, uh, our discussion, especially in the laying the groundwork of this book, is going to revolve around the church. Okay, so two, I don't know, maybe three. Uh, when we say the word church, depending on your upbringing, depending on what you're taught, it could mean one of three things. Either a local church, in which case it is obviously visible, or it could be a universal visible church, or it could be a universal invisible church. Those are the three basic teachings of a church. Um, and then, of course, there may be like a church, no church at all, in which case they have like a house church movement, which is a kind of a church, like they're assembling. And so they say we are like the uh, house church movement nowadays that have come about where they, they meet in uh, churches. And they're, they're, so this official idea of a church has gone away with uh, you remember Harold Camping, years ago, passed away? He was very much against the, the church. And usually these are Adventist groups. And what an Adventist group is, is a group of people that believe that they're ushering in the second coming of Christ. That's why they're called Adventists, like the Seventh-day Adventist. They think that the, only those people that are still abiding by the Sabbath are the, as the group that Christ is going to come back to, and they're ushering that in. Okay, so um, these are Adventist groups, and a lot of them then, uh, do away with the church. And so, of course, their uh, end times the, uh, theology is going to be off and all of that. The uh, universal visible church is essentially the Catholic church. They believe in a universal visible church, right? Which are kind of contradictory to those two words, really. How can you be visible and universal at the same time? And where, where, okay, visible means something that you can see, right? Unless I'm off here. <laughs> all right, visible, I can see it. Where can you see something universal? At what, at what place, standing on the earth, can you see the entire globe at one time? Even if you could, like in space or something, which isn't the case, where is it? Well, they would say Rome, right? But really, uh, the Catholic Church has, um, although they, they, they guide what, what's going on, but really it's local assemblies where it all goes on. So it's not it, it truly universal in nature. And then you have universal invisible, which is even more difficult to understand. But these would be your Protestant denominations. I totally thought that he said that right there. <laughs> wow. I'm looking at Pamela like, what? Did you spill that on classic? Shame on you. And then she's looking at me like, what? No, Earl? <laughs> Ventriloquist right there. Be careful. <laughs> I digress. Um, so, and then I just said invisible. So that was very <laughs> strange. <laughs> okay. So we have uh, uh, universal invisible, because your Protestant assemblies would say that the church is a universal church, but that it's invisible. And so I suppose they stray from the, uh, the understanding of the Catholic Church in that way. What it would be, what is the biblical stand for a church? Unquestionably, I think there's no question in my mind, it should be a local assembly of believers. That's the only way that a church can perform what, what it's supposed to perform. For example, uh, church discipline. <clears throat> I'm going to this, into this discussion because many people uh, like to use the, the book of Ephesians to uh, prove, in fact, they, the book is kind of their mantra of universal church. And I'll explain why in just a minute. But so I want to kind of lay the groundwork. Uh, there are many things in a local church that would be impossible 
were it in a church, excuse me, that would be impossible were it not local. For example, church discipline. How can you carry out church discipline in a universal church? How is it possible to do that? How can you go to your brethren in a universal church that has offended you and then take two or three witnesses? How do you even know who they are? So that's not possible. Uh, what about communion? How is that carried out? Now you say, well, the Catholic Church does it. Yes, but they do it in local assemblies. That's the whole point. Um, what about baptism? Where is the universal baptism? All right. Who's the universal pastor? Oh, well, that's the Pope then, right? right? And so how can the Pope then shepherd everybody in the Catholic Church? It's not possible, is it? Not to mention, uh, the, when the Bible talks about a church, it talks about a local assemblies. <clears throat> The symbolism of a church, whether it be a body, a bride, or a building, has the understanding of something being local. How do you have a universal bride? That's weird, you know. <laughs> I have a bride, and she's always at some place, right? And there she is, and I could point to her. That's my bride, and she's always at a place. Have a universal bride is weird, <laughs> okay? So, uh, a building. How do we have a universal building? Well, the church is pictured as a building, isn't it? How do you have a universal building? Right? Or body, unless you're cut up and strewn all over the, right? So how do you have, it's not, certainly not functioning at that point. So all the symbolism of a church deals really with, with, with local assembly. Not to mention, and probably the strongest proof, is the word itself. It's a called out assembly. Right? So you assemble at a certain place. If they, if they don't assemble it, and in that is, has the idea of uh, location. It's a called out assembly. Where are you called to? Mm, a certain place. So there are lots of call-out assemblies, aren't there? I right? suppose uh, a game, right? Uh, the Super Bowl. Was that a call-out assembly? Essentially it was, right? It has a different purpose than a church completely. But my point is, it was it an ecclesia? Yeah, it was. We have an example of an ecclesia that's not necessarily a church in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, when they, and, were, and it was in Ephesus, incidentally, but they, Paul was called into question, I think it was there in uh, Acts chapter 19, we'll go through it in a minute. It was called, and so they, all, the, all of them gathered together, and the town clerk had to stand up and said that we, were, uh, we could be held for, you know, if, if there was something you have against Paul, then there, there are uh, legal ways to go about it. Okay, we're going to be called into question for this assembly, is what he said. But it was a call-out assembly. So <clears throat> the purpose of a, uh, the, the, what makes a church a, an ecclesia, a distinct ecclesia, is because it assembles in particular to carry out the desire of the Lord. Right? So it is, an, it is a called out assembly like any other, but I'm in particular, and so it makes it very, very unique because it is to carry out what the Lord had, has said to do. That also makes it a, but it, all of it dictates local. Everything. And not to mention the fact that in the Bible there is more than one church, clearly. It uses church as. There are seven churches in the book of Revelation. It says, uh, and I'm here with the Spirit saith unto thee, churches. Okay, so that certainly is plural, isn't it? Which means you can't have a universal church, you have to have universal churches. Now let me just insert this understanding. Most um, higher, especially higher, educational institutions, especially in theology, tend to be universal church. They tend to teach that, right? Even some Bible colleges that are uh, taught by people that they bring in from the outside, right? So they may have pastors. Doing it. I'm not saying if they think that's the right way to do it, that's fine. But there's a danger in that because oftentimes universal church theology is brought in, okay? Um, and the reason why they do that, I believe, is because most of those institutions are started not by a local church. They're usually started by a number of different churches. So that they can maintain their status, you know, Dr. So-and-so wants to maintain his status as a professor, then uh, they try to push this universal church doctrine so that they can maintain their university. Do Dr. Dell Johnson t told me one time, and it's true, he said, uh, people go away, but institutions stay. And that's true. The people that originally start the institutions are not there anymore, but the institution goes on. And you'd think kind of maybe it's the other way around, but it's not. And so when, the, when these institutions continue, although the people that founded them go away, normally or inevitably, they end up changing. So the church is different. In what way? Because the Lord starts the in institution. Okay? Each individual assembly is started by the Lord. So we have a guidebook. All right? So the church should maintain and stay what it's supposed to be. Uh, but... A lot of those institutions were not started by a local church, and so therefore, they end up being um, 
not local church. And so if, if it's anything that's done in the name of the Lord that is not underneath a local church, doesn't really have his sanctioning. Not really. Because he is the head of the church. Right? And, 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 uh, and the savior of the body. And we are members in particular. So that's, that's a church. Now, Ephesians, many people believe, uh, was written, uh, and, and, and this is where the critical text advocates come out, and they mention some things about, about this text, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the theme is the church of the living God. Then who's the author? Well, it's Paul. We see that in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at, which are at Ephesus. Now, you might have read that hundreds of times, but that phrase, at, prepositional phrase, I guess, right? Yep, location. At Ephesus is held highly in question. I'll get to that in a minute. Just hang on. Put your seatbelt on. It's another one of Paul's letters. All right, so where did he write this? Where was he when he wrote it? Well, there's some discussion about that too. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the city of Ephesus. So we're still in the introduction information. Let's get to the city of Ephesus, Ephesus first. This was the capital of what is called Proconsular Asia. Okay. Um, let's, talk, sorry, let's talk about Ephesus here. This is the capital of Proconsular Asia. All right, so. We know that at the time Rome ruled the world, and there was a part of this continent called Proconsular Asia that, that uh, Rome controlled, but they were sort of uh, almost a free ruling body or free ruling area. This would be Asia Minor, what is modern day Turkey. And so that body of Asia, that, that uh, what we call Asia Minor, okay, north of Jerusalem there. And that kind of juts out, and then you have Greece over here, and of course Italy's over here, and this is the Mediterranean region. So people would, uh, that have products from Asia, many times would go by land and would bring those things here. Ephesus is somewhere around here. If you have a, if you have a map in the back there, you can look to see where that is. Um, so Ephesus is kind of right on that uh, peninsula, which is known as uh, Asia Minor. And it's right about there. Actually, it's exactly right there, of course. So this is the capital of what is pre-consular Asia. Ephes... All of a sudden that didn't look right to me. Ephesus... Is it us? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's weird. Why didn't that look right to me? All right, Ephesus. The people that would, uh, this is the Mediterranean region, so anybody that would want to sell their products to the Mediterranean region from Asia would excuse me, would typically pass through this area here and then sail from there. So there were very rich ports and things. And, and uh, Ephesus then was a, was a place where a lot of people went through. Also, uh, it was part of the proconsular Asia. And so it, kind of, it was a, almost like an independent governing body, although they were underneath Rome. Okay, so it was kind of a free city. It had its own assemblies and magistrates. It sort of ran itself, almost like a... Um, well, they call that like a, a commonwealth of Rome, almost like that. Like what Puerto Rico would be to the United States, almost. Something like that. Maybe not exactly like that, but something like that. Or the Virgin Islands. So it would be a commonwealth of Rome, getting the benefits of Rome, but yet kind of governing themselves, having their own assemblies and magistrates. As a result, because it was somewhat independent of Rome, although it had the help of Rome, and because it was a rich seaport, it, is a, it was really a really good place for the gospel outreach, because there... At least at that time, Rome didn't have such a firm grip, which is way over here, maybe on this area. They sort of ran themselves. So it was a good place to begin the, uh, to preach the gospel and to teach it because they would be more free, if you see what I mean. And the persecution that surrounded uh, the area of Rome at that time, uh, they wouldn't be completely exempt from it maybe, but it was a little bit further removed. So they didn't worry about it too much. In, the, in, the, uh, in this area in Ephesus, it was a place of a lot of idolatry, very, very heavily influenced by Greek thought and Greek religion and the pantheon all right, of Greek gods. There was a temple uh, to Artemis, which they say, and there are some ruins of it, of the, uh, of the temple there, that it was four times the size of the Parthenon, so a gigantic temple to Artemis. Supposedly there was an image there at the temple that was carved out of a meteor that had fallen out of the sky. And so they would, um, and so they carved this image out of it, assuming that maybe it came from one of the gods. And 
it just so happens that the original temple that was there, uh, which was put there by the original people, was burnt down. Uh, and what is interesting is when it was burnt down. It was burnt down on the birthday of Alexander the Great. So when Alexander the Great was born, that temple burnt down on that very day. So they rebuilt it then, and so it, it reached kind of the magnificent temple was four times the size of Parthenon. So when Paul went there, that's the temple that he would have uh, visited being in the, in the church of Ephesus there or seen. Okay, so, th so you should know a little bit about the religious activities in, uh, in Ephesus. Okay, then how did the church of Ephesus begin? In Acts chapter 18, we have the beginning of the church of Ephesus. Of Paul's missionary journeys, he established the church of Ephesus and the second missionary journey. If you have those in, your, in the back of your Bible there, you can see that he goes through Ephesus. I have them in different colors. And so he goes right through the, uh, the region of Ephesus, kind of at the latter at tail end of his second missionary journey, and he establishes the church there. And that's recorded for us in Acts chapter 18. And then at that point, on his third missionary journey, he had gone through Corinth and was going to Jerusalem. So he had just left Corinth and he was going to Jerusalem, and this is recorded for us in Acts chapters 19 and 20. So he left Corinth, he was going to Jerusalem on his way, he went through Ephesus again. Uh, and sailing, uh, when he went to Ephesus, and he, and he, and so he kind of went by there twice, really. Or he went by, close by there. And he sailed around this region on his third missionary journey. He would go through here. Here's Ephesus. Corinth is somewhere over here. And, or somewhere around this area. And then he, remember that was made on the Isthmus. If you remember, we talked about the, the Church of Corinth. And so that's here. And he went through Ephesus, came up to Corinth, was coming back through Ephesus, and right down here is the uh, Miletus is island. Miletus. And that's where, coming through again, he's making his way down to Jerusalem right here. So coming back up through there, he went through Miletus, and here's where he called for the Ephesian elders. And they came down to Miletus, and, they, and he met them, and he, and he spoke with them, and he didn't think that he was going to see them again. This was toward the tail end of his third missionary journey. At any rate, he made it here. He uh, landed on what is modern-day Israel now, and then eventually made his way down to Jerusalem. There, he was put under house arrest, or he was put, in, he was put under arrest and taken to Caesarea. He was there for a couple of uh, years, the Bible says, and then he made his way to Rome from there. So he never did see the Ephesian uh, elders again and anybody from that church of Ephesus. So he makes his way to Rome. When he's in Rome there, that is when people believe, I guess we're going to be over here with it. That, that's where they believe he wrote Ephesus. Okay, so let me read, having said that, kind of a basic understanding, let me read then the book of Acts, chapter 19. Verse 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And so this is the end of his third missionary journey. So he sent into Macedonia two of them that ministered unto him, Timotheus and Erastus. But he himself stayed at Asia for a season. All right, so at the beginning of chapter 18, we see Corinth mentioned there. And then toward the middle of it, uh, in verse 19 of chapter 18, it, there's Ephesus. Okay, and he came to Ephesus. So now he's back here again, and, or he's, back, he's coming back through again, and he's going on his way to Jerusalem. Ahead of him, he, send, he sends Timotheus and Erastus to go to Macedonia, right? Um, and they were kind of sailing back up through. He stayed in Asia. And it says there, in the same time, there arose no small stir about that way for a certain man named Demetrius. So this happened, we're going to find out in Ephesus. A silversmith, which made silver shrines for, for uh, Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. When whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. You understand that sometimes the, these temples are to Greek named gods and Roman named gods, okay? So it's really the same kind. They just have Greek and Roman names. Artemis, Diana. Moreover, you see in here that not alone at Ephesus, but almost, all, uh, almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. 
so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed. Now this is building up to something, okay? The tension is building up. Whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. Now Paul sent his friends ahead of him, the Macedonians, kind of on his own, sort of. And when they heard these things, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana, Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion, and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And the certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing. So this is that assembly. Well, what are they doing? Most of them don't even know why they're there. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not wherefore they were uh, come together. So is this an assembly? Yeah, it is. So they're assembled together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with the hand and would have made his defense unto the people. We find out later that Alexander, this man, did Paul a lot of harm in Ephesus. Okay, so he, they, they put him forward there, and he didn't help with his cause at all. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Do you think you get tired of saying that after a while? It's two hours. How many times can you say that in a minute? 40? Maybe? So 40 times 60 times 2. Or 40 times 120. So they're saying it 500 times plus, 600. <laughs> okay, so they're, they're assembled together now. Maybe that's their purpose. I don't know. People are there. They don't know why they're there. It's confusing. And when the town clerk had appeased the people, he said, Ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of, Eph of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diana and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. We have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius, the craftsmen which are with him, have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them plead one another. But if you inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in the lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this con concourse. When he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. He dismissed the ecclesia. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed for to go into Macedonia. Okay, so he's going to follow the people that he sent forth before. Okay, so this all happened at Ephesus. And then we pick it up in verse 13. And we went before the ship and sailed unto Assos, where they're intended to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go foot. So this is Luke speaking. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. So he's, they're sailing up through, that, up through this area right here. Okay. Where's Chios? There it is. And the next day we arrived at Sabas, so another one there, and tarried at Trogilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. All right, so now they came up back through here and came here, Miletus. Where are you at? Okay, so far, for Paul had determined to, sa to sail by F Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia. For he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent unto Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come unto him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Okay, now let me pause there for a minute. He's speaking to the people of that church. Okay. And so he called for the elders, or maybe more than one church there at, at, at Ephesus. At any, re, at any rate, he called them, and they come to Miletus, and he's dealing with people that are the leaders, then, of these independent assemblies at Ephesus. Right? Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And with, so he's mentioning to them, this is what he did. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, and with many tears and temptations, which befell me about the lying in wait of the Jews. And I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So he felt it necessary to defend what he did. Apparently at Ephesus there was a danger 
of them calling Paul into question for his apostleship, maybe, or for the things that he had done. Maybe they said that he was a, um, somebody that robbed the churches and was taken from them and given nothing back. At any rate, there was some kind of testimony against Paul, and he's trying to set the record straight, realizing that he's not going to see them again. So he says in 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. What Paul did, what motivated him? What was his motivation? Well, you say, well, his love for the Lord. That's true. Whenever he went to these places, he wanted to impart unto them some gift. I think that's here somewhere. I may have skipped over it. What gift was he imparting unto him? Unto them? What, what was his gift? What was Paul's gift? I think I mentioned it before. Prophecy. Yeah, he was the gift of prophecy. So what motivated him was Paul having an opportunity to impart some gift unto these people. So he, the second missionary journey, the third one, the first one. What he wants to do is impart some gift. So his gift was prophecy. He wanted to go and preach to them. That was his gift. Okay. So he's saying, that essentially, in a roundabout way, this is paraphrastic, that um, he was faithful to use his gift. Okay, now let me pause there for a minute. I, can, you, can we say that? Can I say that? Have you been faithful to, to use your gift? Do you know what it is? you know what your gift is? And if so, have you been faithful to use it? Paul thought it really important to tell the, the people at Ephesus that he was faithful to use that gift. It's the thing that motivates you. I think we talked about maybe gifts before here, the spiritual gifts. So the thing that motivated Paul was his gift. It is the thing that God's Spirit gives us, and he mentions by the, by the Spirit there. It motivates us to serve in the church. Okay? The church is more than just a place to come and hear preaching. It's an opportunity we have to impart gifts to the people there. Right? It's part of our duty. It's part of what the Spirit does in a body of believers. Okay, so this is why the idea of a local church is so important. So he's talking about what he did among these independent assemblies. He imparted them some gifts. So here's, here we have another thing. How can you impart your gift to the universal church? <laughs> See what I mean? So there, nothing, it, it's not feasible. But now, this is what I'll say too. And the reason why I'm kind of belaboring this point is because you, all of you need to understand that the people that you may minister to one day they can get on the internet really easy. Okay? They can read all this stuff about Universal Church and they can be convinced of those things. So we have to make sure that we understand. Who was Ephesians written to? It was written to the church of Ephesus. Okay? So now I could read on, but, and this all goes on all the way to 38. But he mentions then, and it was very heartfelt. He says, he ceased not to warn everyone night and day with tears because he was faithful to use that gift. His gift. I coveted no man's silver, gold, apparel. All right. So he was happy to go somewhere and to receive no money for it whatsoever. What was his internal motivation? It was his gift he wanted to impart to. So it's that thing that you can do almost tirelessly. Uh, you know, it's something that you love to do. You know how you can, if it's something you really like to do, you can do it and, and, and time doesn't, is no factor. Okay? You just keep, you just do it and do it and you love it. So that was the thing that motivated Paul. We see, I think we see, uh, maybe it's something that's not touched on very much, but it, Paul's very, very distinct motivation was his imparting of his gift. So we see what his relationship to the church of Ephesus and how at this time here he's um, dealing with the elders there. And so he wrote this, it is believed. Now when was it written? Okay, now we're going to look at this. So it was the kind of the establishment of the church of Ephesus and some of the things that he did. When was it written? From where? Where was he when he wrote it? I hear there's a lot of uh, debate also. When he went to Jerusalem, it didn't go, it didn't go very well for him there in, in between what is his third missionary journey and what we would say is his fourth missionary journey, which is really kind of a journey to Rome. Maybe it wasn't a missionary journey at all, but he did have some freedom and he used it to visit some churches. So I guess we can call it that. He went back to Caesarea. This is Caesarea Maritima. All right, I've been there. Supposedly I stood in the place where Paul was imprisoned. I don't believe it, but supposedly. And then he was there a couple of years, and then he went and he traveled to Rome. All right, and so we have his travels at the end of the book of Acts. When he's there in Rome, uh, it is believed, some people believe, that he really kind of three theories. He wrote the book of Ephesus from Ephesus itself. 
which would mean that he wrote those things when he either passed through there in his second missionary journey or when he went through then his third missionary journey and he actually wrote it from Ephesus. That is, you'd have to take astounding leaps in both logic and uh, biblical interpretation to say that he wrote it in Ephesus because absolutely nothing in the Bible uh, teaches that he wrote it from there. Um, and if it were so, why would he send it by the hand of somebody else? That's another thing. Trophimus apparently was a messenger of these letters. And that name is given to us in other books of the Bible, Philippians and, and some other ones, that this man Trophimus. So it would seem to me that what happened was Paul went to a place, wrote all of these letters, and sent them to Trophimus to distribute to the churches back again. So Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians. Uh, he wrote these things. So some people said that he wrote them while he was in Caesarea, here. And then other people say in Rome. I don't think Caesarea is probably, some people believe that way, in my personal opinion, that it wasn't from Caesarea, because he always planned to leave there. Okay? His, his whole um, understanding and all of that was that he was going to go from here to here. So he said, send me things, but send them here. Okay? And, I, I, and even the book of Philemon, he was, he was always kind of anticipating leaving here. And I'm uh, not saying it by anybody's hand, but Trophimus, also, it is believed that he... So, in the book of Ephesus, it says that he was in bonds when he wrote these things. So, was it bondage here or bondage there? I tend to believe it was at Rome that he wrote these things because it was by the hand of Trophimus they were sent out. And uh, so, he probably sent them all out. For Trophimus to have sent this same, these, all these letters out to these churches at individual times, he would have had to go to Rome, then, then go to Philippi, go back to Rome again, and then go here. And that is not too big of a deal for us today because you can just jump on a plane. But back then, you had to travel everywhere and it took a lot of cost and a lot of time. If the trip from Rome, now we're talking about from Rome, so it's not like he's here and he's just going up there. He's sailing all the way from Rome over here, which on the chalkboard doesn't look very far at all. <laughs> but actually it is quite, I didn't put the scale on here, forgive me for that. But this is a long way. So again, we just jump on a plane, go right there, you don't have to worry about eating or anything you see when you get here. But there, think about it, we're talking a month, right? You can't not eat, you will perish. <laughs> Therefore, you have to figure out what am I going to eat? What am I going to do? What am I going to do when I get there? How am I going to, okay, all these things. I'm reading, I was telling at, at lunch, I'm reading Undaunted Courage, which is the story of Lewis and Clark. And uh, they traveled all the way from what is kind of the St. Louis area, all the way to the Pacific and the back again. And it took them years to do that. And along the way, what did they do? Well, they would shoot elk and deer and they would eat them. Okay. So they had to eat. It's kind of, you have to think completely differently. You have to think, is that a reiteration? You have to think differently. Most differently. Most assuredly, differently. <laughs> okay, so, so you, you have to worry about eating. You've got to worry about travel. How many that costs a lot. You can't just say, you know, unless you're going to be a stowaway. I suppose you could do that. But you have to buy, you have, or you've got to work for the person in the boat or whatever. But you have to figure out a way to get there. So it wasn't like it is today. So probably for Trophimus to make all those trips and all that is a little bit un... It didn't seem like that would be right. So probably Paul wrote all these letters. He realized that maybe he wouldn't go to visit these churches, although it was his desire to do so, and sent it by the hand of Trophimus, Ephesians, or Ephesus being one of them. Some of the other books that he wrote are what we call now the prison epistles. So we include uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. It is in the book of Philemon that he mentions that um, going, going to Rome okay, and being there. So probably, uh, scripturally speaking, he probably didn't write it from Caesarea. So, what did he do when he was in Ephesus? Or some of activities, or some we're still we're still here. He made lots of friends. Some of his very close friends, apparently, and uh, so it was very near and dear to him. When he left uh, Miletus, and he told them that he would never see them again, it was a very emotional, heartfelt departure. So it wasn't like, oh, that's too bad, man. Take it easy. You know, it was it was more of a heartfelt uh, departure. Uh, so he, he was uh, very, very close to them and had spent a long time with them. All right, now, who was the audience of Ephesians? Now, here's where we get into controversy. Mm -hmm. The saints in Ephesus, says in 1 1. Okay, now, to me, I just take what the Bible says, right? I mean, how can we know except that it says so? There it says in chapter 1, verse 1 
Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at, which are at Ephesus. Right. This is uh, in Greek, enephesso. Right? It just means at Ephesus. Now, people say, and from the very earliest uh, manuscripts that we have dealing with the book of Ephesians, and even a lot of the critical texts, they all have at Ephesus in there. There are some uh, texts, and whether this comes from the Vaticanus and, and Sinaiticus, that leave out at Ephesus. It is those texts that some people say are more accurate because they're older, although there's evidence that that is absolutely not the case. They're actually younger than, than some of the other uh, manuscripts, that, uh, the uh, extant manuscripts that make up the Textus Receptus. And these critical text people say that at Ephesus is not supposed to be there. Okay, so let's say it's gone. Let's read this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are which are, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Okay, does that make any sense? All right. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are. Saints which are. I'm writing to those which are. <laughs> it's kind of awkward, isn't it? It's an awkward grammar there. It doesn't are. So a lot of people say, well, that's what it's supposed to say. And what Paul is saying is that this is written to general Christendom, every, every Christian. And so that's when they throw in their universal church doctrine. You see how it works? And to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be unto and so forth. So they say that at Ephesus is not supposed to be there. Although many of the critical text Bibles, you'll see that it is in there. But there are a few that do not have it in there. So people take that to mean that actually Paul was not writing it to a, to a group of uh, you know, individual, individual assembly of baptized believers, but write, rather he was writing to Christians in general. <clears throat> so, uh, I would have a problem with that. I don't think the Bible brings that out, and I just take what the text just receptus in the, in the, the proper text says what it is, and it says, at Ephesus. So if it says, at Ephesus, then this is a local church epistle, right? Because it's written to those people. Well, that's what it is. Now, was it, was it to be a cyclical letter? Okay, so now if we say it's a local church epistle, then everything, then, and it's kind of a unique situation because those that, that assembly at Ephesus or those assemblies there, uh, when they received the letter, it was written to them in particular. Now, we read it as to be true for any local assembly, including our own. But the time it was written to this church, these churches maybe. Okay, but they were independent assemblies at Ephesus. So, uh, when they read those things, it was actually written to them. What is interesting then about uh, the Bible is that even in the book of Revelation, and we looked at this before, is that the, those letters to, the, to those seven churches are written to the pastor of that church. So it's written to him in particular, whoever that was. So this, this reinforces and gives us a very, very solid stand of, uh, of individual, individual churches being written to. However, some believe this was, was although written to the book of, uh, to the book of, written to the church at Ephesus, it was to be a cyclical letter. Now, what do I mean by that? It's a letter that you read when you're on your bicycle. <laughs> ben, what does that mean? Um, that after Ephesus read it, they would pass it along to another Yeah, church. exactly. Yep. So it would go through the cycle. Right? It was a cyclical letter. So they would pass it on to the different churches. There does seem to be a lot of... Uh, proof that that is the case. So let's write down some reasons <clears throat> why we believe this letter is probably to have been distributed. Number one, there is no reference in the letter itself to any personal experiences at Ephesus at all. Now we know that he had those things, but that's in the book of Acts. Nothing about his experience at Ephesus is actually in the book of two Ephesians. Okay. Also, number two, there are no salutations to anyone in particular. Just to the church in general, not to any particular individual like it would be for Philemon or some of the other letters. All right, number three, we know that, for example, in the, the book of Corinthians, that he writes to that church in particular. He deals with the sins of that church. But at Ephesus, no real problems in the church are addressed. Not really. Okay, he doesn't really deal directly with the problems that this particular church had. Okay, so it is also believed 
that uh, they say historically that John, the Apostle John, spent some of his latter years at Ephesus. And it happens to be the first church mentioned in the book of Revelation. So um, this would mean that John would incorporate it, and we know the book of Revelation is, is to be out to all of those churches, and so that would kind of maybe reinforce the idea of a cyclical, uh, cyclical value or cyclical character of the, of the uh, letter. Okay, two purposes for the book of Ephesians, and then we'll get into um, the content. Number one, it is to reveal the unity of the body of Christ. Well, take for our theme verses Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Okay, so chapters 1 and one through 3 is that vocation. And then chapters 4, 5, and 6 deal with walking worthy of that vocation. Very simple outline, really. With all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What does the word endeavor there mean? It simply means that it takes work. Okay, endeavoring to keep the unity of the, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Right? So it takes work. You have to labor through these things, but it, it is important. So it is to reveal the unity of the body of Christ, and secondly, to maintain that unity. So we could say, ultimately, to reveal and to maintain the unity of the body of Christ. And so there he mentions uh, verse 4, for there's one body, one spirit, even as you're called the one hope you're calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Okay, so you can see where universal churches advocates would say, well, there you go. There's one, so that's universal. And it, so it would be nice to take out at Ephesus, and then the, you, can, you can put that in there. So they found a manuscript that didn't have it there, called it the older one, took it out, and then used this for their uh, universal church teaching. Okay. Uh, one more quick thing, and we'll take a break. The nature of the book is very... This is some, something interesting about the nature of the book of Ephesians. It is very, very similar to Colossians, so much so that they are termed the twin epistles. They're very similar. In fact, the, the teaching on uh, family and the teaching on um, uh, walking as, 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 as children of light and in love and so forth is this very similar in Ephesians chapter 5 as it is in Colossians chapter 3. So very similar epistles. Okay, so just something about the nature of the two epistles. Okay, now we'll get into the contact, uh, content after a break. So we'll start over here. Just a one or two minute break, then we'll go right to that. Okay, content. You are content. We are content to give the content. Hopefully not in contention. Okay, number one, we're going to say under the content is, and then we're going to take this to mean if, if it's the church, if the theme is the church of the living God, then Paul likens the, <clears throat> excuse me, this church to five different things. Excuse me, six different things. All right, so that's going to be our outline, very simple. It is likened unto this, it's likened unto this, and so forth. Okay, so there are going to be six things here. Now I'll try to remember to put them all over. I'm going to number them, I think. One, two... Okay, the first thing that Paul likens the, and actually, these are these coincide with the chapter breaks too, which is nice. Oh, we're going to get rid of Rome. Rome, Italy is gone, just like that. So it's likened onto a body. All right, so. We see in chapter 1 then, Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> verses 22 and 23, and hath put all things under his feet. Let's talk about Christ. This says that in verse 20. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Fullness of him that filleth all in all. So what is the body of Christ according to this? The church. The church is the body of Christ. It tells us that very clearly right there. So if the church is the body of Christ, then this was always uh, the plan of God. In, in these verses, in chapter 1, we see that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all, were, were all involved in, in, in this, the creation of the church. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so this idea that even 
Uh, let's see, it says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So God the Father was directly involved in this church. And of course, he mentions Christ there. Um, then Christ is mentioned all the way through that. And then for, who first trusted in Christ, it says in verse 12. So Christ himself, of course, was involved with the purchase and with the plan of this church. And then God's Spirit was also involved. We see that in verse 13. Here we have very, very clear doctrinal verses dealing with the fact that once you're saved, you receive the indwelling of God's Spirit. It says it very clearly here. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, and it is until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians 4.30. So all the persons of the Trinity are involved with the establishment and involved with the unity and involved with the, 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 the start of this church and in all similar bodies. Okay, um, then, so it's like an under body. Let's kind of uh, look at some of the things he says here. Um, he says, for example, mm, let's see. <coughs> uh, do I have that verse down here? I think so. Six. Having pre okay, yeah, here it is. So, blessed be the God, in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. <clears throat> okay, a couple of things I want to mention about these verses. We have in verse 3, this idea of being chosen, excuse me, in verse 4, have this idea of being chosen before the foundation of the world. All right, that's what he says there. Then after that, in verses 5 and 6, is the idea of uh, predestined and adopted and accepted, okay, or all those things. But first is this idea of being chosen. And being chosen before the foundation of the world. So what do, what, do I, uh, what do I mean by this? A lot of people mix up this idea of election and predestination. They get way off, okay? Reformed theologians and things get off on this. But really, um, if you look at it this way, it's very, and I, and I see, we see it in this way, and it's patterned this way on purpose, and I think it clears it up for us. Somebody being chosen before the foundation of the world, that is the idea of, a, of election. We have in other passages of Scripture in the Bible, this idea of God's elect, and God's elect, to those who are elected or chosen, is everybody. It is, it is everybody whose Christ's blood was shed for. Who was Christ's blood shed for? Everybody. So that is the elect. Okay? Everybody is, you could say, elected or chosen for salvation. It is God's desire that everybody be saved. What does the Bible say? He would not that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it is His desire that every single human being be saved. Correct? Okay, so that's, they are chosen, pre-chosen, you could say. When they accept the um, plan of salvation, they are then predestinated. Okay, so a lot of times we, we take this idea of election and predestination and kind of put it together. But the truth of the matter is election comes before predestination. When people say that being somebody being elected and predestinated is the same thing, it's not the same thing. And I think we have this pattern here. Right? Again, we can prove it in the scriptures, um, Romans 7, 9, uh, 1 Timothy 2.10, 2 Timothy 4.10, um, and then 1 Peter uh, 1 at the end there. It all kinds of deals with the fact that we have uh, this idea of election, of, of the elect needing to be saved. See, a lot of people say that people who are God's elect are saved people. Well, that's not true. Some of them are not. Okay? Everybody is God's elect. In fact, in the Bible, we have the, the elect being saved. Well, if the elect are already saved, why do they need to be saved, right? So, if you want, I'll go through some of those verses, but I think I have before. The point is that that's election. So, election deals with everybody. And here it says before the foundation of the world. Now, once they are accepted, or once they accept the plan of salvation, then they are predestinated. Okay, then this idea of predestination kicks in, if you'll excuse the term. And now we're predestinated to things. Now we're predestinated to all of these things, okay? And then also we have the privilege of being part of the body of Christ, which is to be unified. Okay? So that to me kind of clears up this idea of election and predestination, and it, and it definitively proves Reformed theolo theology incorrect. Okay, so it's likened unto a body, and here it deals with uh, Christ being the head. 
um, what, is, what is it about a body? All right. Well, body is made up of members, made up of pieces. Right? Your eye, your nose, your ear, your elbow. Okay, all those things are all pieces. And what's interesting about your body is it, it is, uh, kind of prefigures the church. Because those areas of your body which are least esteemed tend to be the most important. For example, your pinky toe. The one that went wee, wee, wee all the way home. <laughs> that little thing that I heard somebody said that I don't even think there's a bone in there. <laughs> I just think it's a hunk of beet hanging off the end of your foot. I go, no, I think there's a bone in there. And so you might say, oh, it's my little toe. I don't think much about the one that went wee, wee, wee. But if I took a hammer, a ball peen hammer, and smashed your little toe <laughs> repeatedly until it was damaged extensively to where you could not use it in its natural means any longer, you couldn't run, you'd have a hard time walking, you would be in extreme pain. So all of a sudden that little meat toe <laughs> has some meaning in my life. It's not just a piece of meat. I like that wee wee thing there. There it goes all the way home. But I don't spend a whole lot of time on it. I don't shine it. I don't buff the nail. <laughs> I don't do those things. I don't even put polish on it. You ladies may. I don't know if you guys. Anyway, so I don't do any of those things. In fact, we cover them most of the time. I wouldn't want to stand up here without any shoes or socks. That would be very strange. Unless you're in Alabama. Yeah, unless you're in Alabama. That's right. Or West Virginia, right? Um, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hillbilly. Come on. So, um... Now, um, the ABC's Wide World of Sports years ago used to have a, a, a precursor, and they would say, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And uh, so we always say the agony of defeat. <laughs> okay, so well, no, nobody really spends a whole lot of time perfuming your little toe or anything. But the hair on your head? No, not me. <laughs> Turns out you don't need any. It's real. Fun. But you lady, right? Uh, and we're glad that you do that. <laughs> but you don't need it. It's part of your body, I guess. But you don't need your hair. You say, yes, I do. <laughs> I wouldn't show my face. I would be socially unacceptable without any hair. So yes, I do. But you don't. It doesn't really have any true function at all. But your little toe does. So we don't spend a whole lot of time with a little toe. But really, it is far more important to the service and operation of your body than what your hair is. You know, that's true in the church, too. I found that to be absolutely true. If we're going to have a church service, now, some of you might gasp in horror at what I'm about to say. You don't need music. <gasps> you don't. You don't need music for a church service. Oh, but how much do we... Oh. Right? We gather together for what reason? Listen to the teaching and preaching of God's Word. I say, well, music helps out. Well, maybe... For some people, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But can we have a church service without music? Yes. Could we have, now, could we have a church service with screaming babies in the, in the auditorium? Nope. <laughs> Not going to work. <laughs> Open your Bible. <laughs> Open your Bible. <laughs> you won't even get past the text. I mean, come on. A, a cell phone goes off and it disturbs a preacher. How many, ten little babies? All the babies that are in a nursery are in the church service. It's not going to work. You can't have a church service. So that makes those nursery workers real, real important. You couldn't even have a church service without it. What if we had cockroaches walking around all over the place in the auditorium and rats and all the rest of it because nobody takes out the garbage? We'd have people screaming, ladies screaming, you know, standing on the benches and all the rest of it. We couldn't have a church service. It'd be out of hand. All of a sudden, it makes the person that takes the trash out pretty important. I don't, we don't think about that person. I don't know who straightens the hymn books. I don't know, but it, it has to do with the testimony. And all that stuff is important. It's funny how the kind of body is, is a picture of that, of how things are. But anyway, that's kind of fun. So, all right, now, selecting down to a body, and it's also, this is the church. We're talking about the unity of the church. By the way, the body is unified, all right? Don't, the one part of your body can't say to another part, um, you know, I don't need you. All, all the pieces need each other, and it has to be, and, unless all the pieces are there, they say, okay, people have amputated, like, all right, I get it. But for, for the most part, it always has to be together. And then liken onto a temple. You know, all these things scream local church. So they seem local, local. A body is in one place. A temple is in one place. This we see in uh, chapter 2. <clears throat> 
All right, verse 21 and 22 there, it says, um, In whom all the building, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for the habitation of God through the Spirit. Remarkable. Just like the Old Testament temple was the habitation of God for the Jews, so the individual Christian, and actually the church itself, um, because of the individual Christians bring the God's Spirit with them, you could say, is uh, the a temple of, of the Holy Ghost, and so our temple of the Holy Spirit. And is, it says they're fitly uh, framed together, very much like a body. You, if you had the door on the roof, and you understand that a building is made in such a way to be functional. Right? And if you have it any other way, then it's not functional anymore. So it has to be all together, it has to be in one place to function properly. All right? So that's like an unto a temple. What else? What does chapter 3 say is like an unto? Uh, to a mystery. In what way mystery? This is musterion in Greek. What way mystery? What you mystery? So when you think of mystery, what do you think of? Well, something that's hidden. Right? It's mysterious. It's hidden. You can't see it. You can't perceive it. What about the church makes it a mystery? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 4. Whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hidden God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. In what way is the church a mystery? Well, it tells us in verses, uh, five, verse 5 and 6, really. 6, really. But it says in verse 5, Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, therefore a mystery, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that, here it is, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, and of the same body, and partakers, of the promise of Christ by the gospel. Can you imagine a staunch Jewish Pharisee person reading that? The, the Gentiles are to be fellow heirs. Everything that our father is Abraham, we are disciples of Moses. And obedience to the law is Moses. You have to say it with a tight up, it's Moses. And because they have such pride in their position as Jews. Well, here the Bible says, and Paul writes even in the book of Romans, that really Jews are people who are in the church. That's a true Jew, really. Fellow heirs of the same body, none of this distinction, and partakers of the promise in Christ by the gospel. Wow. That's the mystery. The mystery before, hidden, maybe in the Old Testament, was this idea of a church. Why was it hidden to them? Well, there's a lot of discussion about that, but I think it's because the Lord's return was supposed to be immediate, but because the Jewish people did not accept him, he's prolonged his return and has created then a church in the interim. Um, so that's likened unto a mystery. Chapter 4. It's likened unto a new man. Look at verse 22. Chapter 4. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man. In Greek, that's a funny word for... Oh, no, sorry. No, no, sorry. In Hebrew, the word for old man is zakain. Because it uses zakain. That's how I remember that. Anyway. Then verse 23, and, he, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. All right, so we have an old man that is to be put off, and a new man that is to be put on. Almost like a garment. What is it that should be put off about the old man? Corruption, deceitful lusts. And then renewed in the spirit of your mind, and then you put on the new man. What's the difference between that one? No more deceitful lust, no more corruption, but rather righteousness and true holiness. So it's like another new man. So the church is to be like a new man. What does this new man do? Takes off the old and puts on the new. Is renewed. Renewed in the spirit of your mind. So the, when the Lord looks at a church, it seems like he looks at it as an organism. As a, you know, like a body, a temple, a building a mystery, a new man, a person itself. That means the church members are all interconnected, very much like a body is, very much like the pieces of a building are. The, the, the members of this local church are interconnected. And the same uh, head uh, directs all. The same heart pumps blood through all of it. You see what I'm saying? So it's very it's interconnected. So when the Lord sees a church, it's actually a, it's an organism. It's a body. It's a functioning, living organism, the church is. So it's more than just a group of people gathering together. And we also see the, the 
extreme importance of being a member of a church when you, if you're a New Testament regenerated Christian, you'd be a member of a church. So let's look at the uh, things about uh, the new man that makes him stable. The old man is <clears throat> in unstable. It says corruption. Things that are corrupt are unstable, aren't they? You might think of a car, right? It's made out of steel. And steel rusts. And if it rusts and corrupts enough, it can no longer be used. And it's unstable. I had a 1976 Plymouth Valiant when I was in college here. It had a slant six on it. That thing ran forever. It had one belt. And it was like a tractor engine. You couldn't, you could not, you know, you could step on as much as you wanted to, the engine never quit. Now, I can't say the same thing for the body of it. In fact, I took it to the recycler place right here and it was scraping the ground because the front end collapsed because of the rust. <laughs> and I let my, my uh, fiance, he would drive that a few times, but I'm glad it didn't wreck with her. Anyway, that was a Plymouth Valiant. And so things corrupt. My point is that things corrupt, they break apart. They fall to pieces. That's the old man, because it says it's corrupt. But the new man is renewed day by day, the Bible says in another part, of, and, and it is um, true holiness. So, this thing that is not corrupt has things that stabilize it, right? Stabilizers, if you will. And there are seven great stabilizers to the church being likened unto a new man. Let's list those things. All right, we have, first of all, one body. So this idea of being stabilized because they're all part of one body. That's a stabilization. One spirit. That's also a stabilizer. It's the idea of one. So anything he mentions here is one is a stabilizer. Number three, one hope. Remember, we said the theme was unity, right? So this is what he's getting at. He's not getting at the fact that it's universal church. He's talking about the unity within the church. One Lord, four. Number five, one faith. Number six, one baptism. By the way, it's not talking about Holy Spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit never baptizes anybody. And number seven, one God. So, one body, spirit, hope, Lord, faith, baptism, and God. This is the stabilizer. And of course, we all have one great Savior, which I suppose could be another thing there. But we have seven great stabilizers mentioned here in chapter 4, like and unto a new man. So this new man is renewed. What are three things that are different about the new man? So if, he, if he's renewed in, in uh, righteousness and true holiness, what is going to be different about that man? Number one, he's going to walk differently. He's going to go to the place he used to. He's not going to do the things he used to do. He's going to walk differently. He's going to say different things. This is in a very real sense. This is true. He's going to say different things. And he's going to do different things. His works and his words and his walk. Isn't that nice? Are all going to be different. All right, then. Number five, the church, which is to be unified, is likened unto a bride. All right. <clears throat> Now, here again, this screams local. Nobody's going to be uh, um, oh. It's so weird, I can't remember the English word. Um, prometido. Promised. Yeah, promised, I know, but what's Committed. the... Betrothed. The betrothed, yeah, I guess that would be the more of the word, yeah. Like, you know, like promised. Yeah, I guess promised. But what do we say? Um, Say a fiancé, but I'm engaged. Yeah, engaged. That's the word I'm looking for. I couldn't think of it. Engaged, yeah. So nobody gets engaged to a bride that's all over the place. <laughs> okay, what, what are the dues of the bride? Okay, so we, the church is seen. <laughs> I know that's gross, but I'm not even going to go there. So this bride. By the way, nobody that's uh, engaged wants to be called a universal bride. That's not going to work. <laughs> All right, the duties of a bride. So, what is a bride that's engaged? What is her job? What, should be, what is she to be doing? <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Number one, <clears throat> these are five things. Six. A bride is to be separated. All right, and this is in chapter 5. In other words, unto nobody else but that person. He's to be awaiting his return, as it were. 
be separated, be serving, so they'd be doing things, working. Uh, so if we look at this as the kind of the Hebrew wedding, which I think um, Dr. Gambrell did a great job, if you remember that sermon when he came and preached it, of, of showing this, you know, the passage of the, of the Hebrew wedding. Be separated, be serving, be searching, waiting for the return. All right, so the church is like this. The church should be separated, very much like a bride who's away, who's engaged and is awaiting her husband. Separated, serving, searching, spirit filled. Okay, it shouldn't be. A, it shouldn't be a chore to wait for him. Oh, another day! Goodness gracious! I should be filled. Should be happy. Be singing. There you go. Mm -hmm. Right there, verses 19 and 20. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. All right, and then submissive, verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another. Um, what was the passage for that? Uh, they're all in chapter 5. Uh, I can give you individual verses there, but separated, verses, verses 3 and 11, serving, Verse 16, redeeming the time. Um, then searching, verse 17, wherefore be ye not wise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Spirit filled, verse 18, be not drunk of wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Singing, mention that here, and then submissive, this idea of submitting. So, <clears throat> and then like and lastly, chapter 6, what would that one be? What do you know about Ephesians chapter 6? Likened unto a soldier, exactly. Okay, so this has the idea of, of warfare. A couple things here. Uh, we have a common enemy. All of this is designed to, to, to give us the understanding of the unity of the church. Okay, a, a, a fighting force that is not unified uh, is, is useless. Okay, unless everybody's going in the same direction, it's, it's pointless. So, we have to have training. And uh, we see in verse 4 there, uh, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So this idea of training should be done in the church. That's a very, very, very huge part of a church. And that has to do the idea of, because we're really training soldiers. That's what we do. The common enemy, Satan, <clears throat> and a, social, uh, a soldier, excuse me, also needs equipment. What would David have done if he didn't have a sling in his stones? He needed to have equipment, didn't he? he had to be equipped. Sometimes that equipment is training itself. Okay, and then the exhortation. So I want you to remember, the, so the equipment is the armor of God. It tells us here in verse 11, then all the way down through, uh, I guess, 19, or uh, 18, uh, has the armor of God. So all this piece of the armor. So the church is to be equipped, and individual members are to be equipped. And then the exhortation, the encouragement. Three things that a soldier does, that a church is said to do here, awaiting the return of Christ. One of them is stand. They are to stand. All right, we see that in verse 11 and 13 and 14, we're told to stand. By the way, and you've heard this before, I would think, there's no armor for uh, retreat. It's all to stand and face. Because to stand, uh, you will stand against the wiles of the devil. Trickery, the sleight of hand. Or if it take unto you the whole armor of God, you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So this idea of standing. So the encouragement, the exhortation to, to a soldier is to stand. If there's a fight out there to be fought, you don't run, a soldier doesn't run, run away from the fight. A soldier's whole job is to stand in a fight. That's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason. What kind of soldier would he be if at the point where the battle comes, they turn and run? Well, that's not, that's, that has no purpose. All that training was for naught. So number two, pray. This is the encouragement, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. All right, let me say something about prayer. And I've heard this before, and it's true. Prayer is not preparation for the battle. Prayer is the battle. That's your battle. So if you win it, the battle of prayer, you've won. You have to strive in prayer, don't you? You have to put on all these things. You have to put on your whole armor. All of that is involved in prayer. It's a battle. It's a strife. And then watch. Uh, watching uh, the second part of verse 18. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So what does a soldier do? Watch. He's vigilant, right? A soldier has this idea of prayer. And prayer is the thing that gives you the, oh, I'd say the fighting spirit, if you will. 
because you can train somebody in, in the best training, the best equipment, best equipment, best training, but when it comes right down to it, what's the thing that's going to get them to step out and do what they're supposed to do? Well, there has to be a, a spirit. That's what the word esprit de corps really means. Okay? It's a fighting spirit. And it has to be there because all the rest of those things without that are to the wayside. It doesn't mean anything. And Paul and Tychicus, of course, who was to send us a letter, were good examples of that. And we see that in the end of that.